Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Crash Proof Retirement Show. I am Phil Canella, along with my courageous co-host, Joanne Small. And this week, Joanne and I are very excited to welcome to the show best-selling author and renowned economic forecaster, Harry Dent. And Mr. Harry Dent is also the editor of a free newsletter known as Survive and Prosper, which you can find right on our website at CrashProofRetirement.com, or you can simply go to www.HarryDent.com. Now, Mr. Dent is most recognized for his proven track record of predicting global market trends. His noted accurate predictions include Japan's recession of the 90s, the United States bull market of the late 90s, and most recently, the great crash of 2008. Harry Dent has a book coming out this January titled The Demographic Cliff, which predicts another market crash starting in 2014. So Joanne and I thought it'd be great to invite Harry Dent to the show to ask him why he thought markets were going to be doomed in the future and what the everyday investor should do to protect themselves. But first, we wanted to know more about Harry Dent's unique method of predicting market trends, which he refers to as the science of demographics. Now, this is a method that has proven effective in the past, and now his method is calling for another market crash. So we wanted to know and learn more. I asked Harry Dent to explain how he uses the science of demographics to forecast this country's economy. We can tell you when people are going to earn, spend, borrow, invest, and even buy potato chips at age 42. I mean, nothing more predictable than consumer demographics and and things people do as they age. And that's what drives the economy. Governments don't drive the economy. They act like they do. They just react. When, when we got inflation, they tighten. When we slow too much, they loosen. You know, governments should just let the economy be what it is, facilitate innovation, and quit intervening in the economy. They're killing the golden goose here. It's all demographics. It's that simple. Harry Dent, you've written several books over the years, but one of your best-selling books was called The Great Depression Ahead. Why don't you tell our listeners about that book and why you felt it was important to write? You know, that book was written by early 2008. The crisis set in in late 2008, early 2009. But then governments, I mean, we knew governments were going to stimulate. And we said, oh, yeah, we may get a couple-year rally here. But I did not expect $11 trillion in balance sheet expansion, QE from governments around the world, and endless stimulus and bailouts. This is... This is crazy, number one. It's unprecedented in any crisis in history. And governments are just saying, we won't let there be a downturn. We, we, we let a great debt bubble and financial bubble happen in housing and stocks and the economy and debt and everything else. And we're just not going to take the consequences and we're just going to keep stimulating and taking more and more of the drug to keep from going down. This is not a good strategy. I mean, a common sense, a 10-year-old could understand that adding debt to a debt crisis through quantitative easing and through endless government deficits. I mean, Japan's been in this coma economy for over two decades now because they were the first to go off this demographic cliff of the baby boom generation peaking. They, they peaked way ahead of the U.S. and Europe. That's why we were bearish on them in the 90s and bullish on the Europe and the United States. They've gone nowhere. But you brought something decades. up very interesting about the federal government. You said that our federal government only reacts, and that indicates they're not being proactive. Yeah. Kind of like the 29 crash, the government only came in after a catastrophe, kind of like these hurricane category fives, yeah, Katrina. it happened. I mean, when, when, when Roosevelt came in in 1933, the whole crisis was already over. Unemployment had already peaked, stocks had already bottomed, real estate bottomed. All around that time, he walked in and acted like he turned around things. No, the free market system crashed everything deleveraged debt, brought stock and home prices and everything down to reality and set the stages, you know, with business failures and bank failures for incredible efficiency and innovation. And then we grew again with or without. And, and what's happened differently here 
is governments this time said, oh, we studied the Great Depression. We don't want the banking systems to melt down, even though they made horribly bad loans across the board, encouraged by the government, backed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all types of government agencies. We don't want to admit we screwed up and created a bubble, so we're just going to keep the bubble going and take more and more of the drug. This is the most irresponsible thing I've ever seen in all of history, and I've studied all of history in finance. Well, I'm talking about being irresponsible, and it's, it's, it's a good segue in to Senator Elizabeth Warren. I think she puts it so elegantly and so accurately. I'd like you to listen to a soundbite of Senator Elizabeth Warren where she is on CNBC talking to some of the analysts, and I believe she lays it out very, very nicely about how they deregulate it and what it did to these industries today. Listen to the, Here's Senator Elizabeth Warren. It's 1794. George Washington is in his first term, and what did we have? We had a credit crisis. In fact, if you read the local papers, it was described as a credit freeze. And every 10 to 15 years, we have boom and bust, boom and bust, boom and bust, right? We wipe out, uh, we have, we call them panics. The banks all shut down, have a complete financial system collapse. People lose their little farms, small businesses, until we hit the Great Depression. And we hit the Great Depression and said, you know, we can do better than that. We can write a set of rules that's going to make it work better than that. Mm -hmm. And so what did we do? We came up with the first one, make it safe to put your money in a bank, FDIC insurance. The second one, Glass-Steagall. Banks are going to be run like public utilities. They're going to be run boring, modest profit margins. Risk-taking will be where we can let it fail. And the third one, we get these new rules in for the SEC. Those three rules bought us 50 years Before of security and prosperity. Right. And our response to that was to say, you know, regulation is just a pain. <laughs> Let's get rid of it. Uh, <clears throat> who needs it? It costs us too much. So we start pulling the threads out of the regulatory fabric. And we do it multiple ways. We change the laws, Glass-Steagall. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't appoint new regulators for whole new areas. We let the thing burgeon and we keep the same or number let, of or, or tiny or cops on the beat. we let Goldman appoint the regulators. That's yeah. right. That's we, would say. So we deregulate and we we had information about this. Remember, first thing was the savings and loans crisis, right? We deregulate the SNLs, and there's a big warning. 700 of them collapse because they don't run this right. The next one, long-term capital management. We're supposed to learn the lesson that when you sneeze in one part of the world, it's heard somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then we hit the third one, which for me is Enron, which told us the books are dirty. Right? It told us in a big public way that these institutions that are getting all these certifications from the outside, in fact, have dirty books. What were the lessons we learned from that? We just continued on our path. We collapsed the system. What do you say to that, Harry Dent, when you hear Senator Elizabeth Warren talk about the way the system was safe for 50 years until government decided it was just too, too costly, let's make it a little more free market. And now, here we are. 50 years later, and look what's going on with this economy. Do you agree with her? First of all, if there's going to be a first woman president, I would vote for her. This is exactly what happens throughout history. We have a major financial and debt bubble like in the Roaring Twenties. It collapses and causes a Great Depression. We realize we need to regulate debt and, and banking and things like that. And by the time the next big generation rolls around, we've forgotten all these rules. We reversed these things starting in 1996 under Bill Clinton. We said, oh, we don't need these regulations anymore. Why? We haven't had a banking crisis. That's exactly what sets up the next one. It, it is just unbelievable. You can't let banks and investment banks and brokerage firms and investment firms all get together because they just promote each other and promote this debt bubble. And, and who gets screwed is the investor who doesn't get objective advice and gets bubbles that burst. Harry Dent, this quantitative easing by the federal government pumping $85 billion into a bond buying program. What is this going to do for the banks? And is this really going to help our economy? We are propping up the banks that should have failed. And if the banks had failed, we would have gotten a lot of loans to consumers and businesses written down to market value before this whole crazy thing happened with the banking system and government. And it was a collusion between Wall Street and K Street. It's that simple. A collusion to up the economy, increase the steroids, increase debt, give everybody a home and stuff, and now the thing's collapsing. If the government had not protected the banks with quantitative easing, given them free money, they'd have had to write these loans down. And a lot of people would have seen a $300,000 mortgage go down to 200000 or a $500,000 mortgage go down to 250000 
and we would have better cash flow to deal with this crisis. This, this is quantitative easing, creating money out of thin air. I mean, come on, a 10-year-old can understand that you don't solve a debt crisis by creating more debt and more leverage, and that's all the government's done. They're keeping the bubble going. The money's going somewhere. It's leaving the investors and the everyday person's portfolio, and where's it going? Financial institutions have become the largest part of our economy in the last 20, 30 years based on this acceleration of debt. Debt and the profits of financial institutions, banks, investment funds, investment banks, all of these correlate directly with the rise in debt. So if debt's growing two and a half times the economy, they're growing two and a half times the economy. They're the biggest beneficiaries, and they have big special interests in the government. And when things go down, like you say, what they what do they do? Oh, well, we need to solve our debt crisis. Oh, we'll bring Goldman Sachs in. Let the fox into the hen house? Right. Are you kidding me? And what do they do? They protected the banks, not the average household. Everyday investors get what on their investments for safe? Zero. So where does all this bring us? With deregulation, with the fall of the communication firm WorldCom and the energy firm Enron, and we see GM go into bankruptcy, fleece their investors, come out making eleven billion dollars two years later, pay no one back. I mean, it's a sign of fraud. Where is the economy heading? What is your best prediction? Okay, very simple. I've got a chart on the Dow that is crystal clear, and nobody looks at it. I, you know, I go on CNBC and all these major programs. People say, oh, I'm crazy because I'm thinking another crash is going to happen. That's all we've had is bubbles and crashes since 1987, one after the next. You bubble it up with low interest rates and speculation, which encourages that, and the government pushing the economy and investment firms investing at 50 to 1 leverage in banks. This is crazy. So you build up these bubbles, and all this QE is going not into bank lending because consumers and and businesses already overborrowed in the boom. They don't need to have more debt. It's going into investment speculation. So we got a bubble in the Dow. Every bubble has gone higher, 2000, 2007, and now 2013, and every mm-hmm. crash has gone lower. I'm predicting the Dow is going to go up to about 16,000 to 16,700 by early next year and then crash to 5,800 by 2015 or 16. Higher highs, lower lows, because these bubbles – especially this last one, is all on stimulus. At least the last two bubbles before this were based on demographics and Mm -hmm. technology advancements. But this is pure government stimulus, $2 trillion a year on average between quantitative easing, monetary injections, and fiscal deficits, $2 trillion a year to create $350 billion in, in GDP at 2% growth. This is a horrible ratio. Now, Harry Dent, to support that theory that you just said, Since 1929, there's been 18 major crashes, which means it's a cycle. Every five years or so, the markets have a crisis. And what you're saying is each crisis, the bubble gets a little bigger and the crash gets a little worse. Am I understanding you right? Yeah, and and on top of that, every 40 years when a generation peaks in spending, like 1929 and 68 and now 2007, these cycles get more dramatic in the topping. I mean, from 65 to 72, we had three higher booms in the stock market and three bigger busts into 74 and eventually into 82, and and that's what's happening here. So it's the same thing happening again 40 years later, and economists have no clue. They don't know what drives the economy. They think if they keep interest rates at this or that, us consumers will just spend more money. We spend more money because we're raising our families and earning more money, and and that slows in the mid-40s to the early 50s, and then it drops off like a rock. Well, let me ask you this, Harry. Harry Dent, let me ask you this. With the next market crash, do you feel that it's going to be a world event, a world crash? And if so, what will that mean? The last one was. Four states in the United States had a subprime crisis. It, it really narrowed down. California, Arizona, Nevada, and, and, and Florida. And that set a whole global crash in stock markets and in a lot of real estate markets around the world going down sooner or later. The same thing. I mean, it's not just us. Europe's stimulating wildly. They have even worse demographics than we do in the future. China is the biggest bubble in the world, totally government-driven, with no accountability. And all these things are going to burst. So all it takes is a trigger when the economy is already overridden with debt. Things are going to go down. It's just a matter of when the government stimulus policies fail because demographics keep getting worse. They're, they, you know, Europe is in deep trouble 
and they haven't gone off the demographic cliff with the baby boom yet. They're going to go off starting next year. Japan went down first in the 90s and then us in 2008. Europe is next, and then south, the rest of East Asia, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, next. The whole world's going to go down. And governments are acting like, oh, if we just get over this little banking crisis, we'll get back to normal. There is no getting back to normal. Why, why do you think, Harry Dent, government is in denial with this? Because they're the best at interest. They Reed. don't create this bubble. They don't want it to burst. They're going to look right. like idiots. No central bank head, no politician like Obama or George Bush wants this to go down on their watch, so they keep kicking the can down the road. I mean, again, $2 trillion a year? For somebody to tell me we have a sustainable recovery, and I say, wait a minute, what would it be without this $2 trillion? It would be a deep downturn. I mean, this is obvious. A 10-year-old could see this. Harry Dent, do you think that Wall Street has a fiduciary responsibility to the everyday investor? You know, I got my big start with the great boom ahead when I predicted the 90s boom in the early 90s when nobody thought it was going to happen. By 1995, stockbrokers, mutual funds were running at me. I was lecturing this industry. And I kind of realized that most stockbrokers and mutual fund firms, they don't care about their clients. They're in collusion, too. You know, the mutual funds really kind of butter up the stockbrokers and bring speakers like me and take them on golf trips and dinners and wine and stuff. And they just pick the fund that's either in their firm or the one that butters them up the most. They're not representing most investors fully. Some, a lot of them do. And we have a lot of financial advisors in our network that do, but most don't. They're just salesmen. And as long as the boom's going and the bubble's going, they're going to sell, 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 tell you no problem. And then they're going to say, oh, we got you diversified. And if things crash, you'll be okay. Well, in 2008, eight nine, everything went down. When, when a debt and financial asset bubble burst, everything goes down except for cash, safe bonds, and the U.S. dollar, by the way. So you have to protect your assets in this next crash. And I think 2014 and 15 is the next big danger period from our cycles. This bubble has been created by the government, has been pumped up at unprecedented levels, but it's getting to extremes. And you know what? Just when people get comfortable, people are finally, they were skeptical of this bull market mm -hmm. in the beginning and everyday investors. Now everyday investors are jumping back in. Mm -hmm. Like they did in the late 90s. Like just they like did they in did. the late 90s mm -hmm. and they did in 2006 and seven, mm -hmm. just to get crucified. Again, you have, you have to say, look, this bubble has created great gains for most investors. You've got to protect what you have before things crash again, because they are going to crash. Do you think any one person can control a market or a sector of the market? Maybe to some degree. Okay. Um, before you but, go on, but, but, I'd like you to hear a little yeah. sound bite. This is a popular advisor. His name is Jim Cramer. You can see him on CNBC. Oh, yeah. Prior to... Jim Cramer being on Mad Money. In 2006, we found a lost interview on the internet. I'm going to play it for you and our listeners, and I'd like to get your comment. But before I play it, I'd like to tell you what you're going to hear so when you hear it, you absorb more of it. He talks about how he manipulates and controls the market by taking a short position, buying a stock to go down. He says that to do that, you have to create a fiction. You don't want to say anything remotely true, and you do it because the SEC doesn't know the difference and doesn't understand it anyway. And he says it's very satisfying, but he would never say this on TV. Here's Jim Cramer from Mad Money. You know, a lot of times when I was short at my hedge fund and I was positioned short, meaning I needed it down, I would uh, create a, a level of activity beforehand that could drive the futures. Now, you can't create an impression that a stock's down, but you do it anyway because the SEC doesn't right. understand it. You've really got to control the market. You can't let it lift. And it's really important to use a lot of your firepower to knock that down because it's the fulcrum of the market today. What's important when you're in that hedge fund mode is to not do anything remotely truthful because the truth is so against your view that it's important to create a new truth to develop a fiction. I think it's important for people to recognize the way that the market really works is to have that nexus of hit the brokerage houses with a series of orders that can push it down, then leak it to the press, and then get it on CNBC. That's also very important. And then you have a vicious cycle down. It's a pretty good game. Oh, by the way, no one else in the world would ever admit that, but I that's, do care. That's right. And you can say that here. I can't. I'm not going to say it on TV. Does honesty cost too much to Wall Street? 
Well, yeah, it does. But, I mean, he, here's the greater point. Jim Cramer alone cannot move the markets past the point. But all these hedge fund managers and, and investment banks who are investing only because the government allows it collectively have way more impact on the markets than they used to. And, and the everyday investor doesn't have a chance because they just short the markets when things go up and everybody gets in and then they scare everybody out just like he's talking about. And then they reinvest again. Yep. They are just like wolves killing rabbits. That's Harry Dent, the editor of the free newsletter, Survive and Prosper. Harry Dent has successfully predicted in 1992 the late 90 boom and also the 2008 crash. Harry, Joanne and I had the opportunity of going to Washington, D.C. to talk to then the Inspector General of the Security Exchange Commission, H. David Kotz. And we asked him to explain, is shorting a stock, taking a short position on a security, illegal? Here's H. David Kotz, then the Inspector General, and his reply. There is an appropriate way to short stocks. I mean, you can certainly uh, legally say you believe a stock's going to go down and, and uh, you know, bet on that in the market. But if you manipulate the stock by propaganda or by rumors... Um, then that, that can be illegal activity. Isn't that exactly what Kramer did by manipulating the stock by rumors and propaganda and leaking it out to the press and CNBC? Isn't that illegal? And why is it that this guy is now the cheerleader to tell people where to buy and sell? Well, again, I don't know the ins and outs of what he did exactly. Like you say, he admitted this, but this is what investment managers and major traders, I mean, billionaire traders and hedge funds and investment banks like Goldman Sachs, this is what they do. They, they sell credit to false swaps, you know, to all their investors, and then they short them when they get overvalued and crucify the same people. But it, isn't, it, that, it, it, isn't that a form of fraud? Is better, sir, from my point of view. Isn't that a fleecing? Isn't that fraud? I think it is. I think um, it is, too. I tell you, I would be happy the day that some of these people went to jail because, uh, again, here's the thing. The, the government should be protecting people against this sort of stuff. But the government understands that in this bubble, if Wall Street doesn't keep making money, and if we don't keep these banks and investment banks and hedge funds together, if they fall apart, the whole system falls apart like in the early 1930s, and everybody gets hurt. I'm, I'm like, yeah, everybody does get hurt if this happens, but – the cleansing and detoxing of debt and the efficiencies in businesses and, and wiping out all the special interests like Wall Street here that have created this bubble is good for the everyday American long term. The middle class first emerged out of the Great Depression for the first time in history and became the first high-earning, broad middle class in history. The Great Depression was part of what created the prosperity after World But wasn't War II it regulation that made that wealth grow over the 50 years that there was regulations and they were enforced? Isn't that what happened? And then they deregulate it and it's taking it yes, back. Yes, yes. I mean, again, overregulation is bad. Overly complicated regulation is bad. But no, you have to have rules and certain regulations in any free market economy because otherwise the 800 pound gorilla the mafias will emerge the wall street groups the special interests will emerge for the most money and rig the markets in their own favor so you have to have regulations and you shouldn't back off on them after 50 or 60 years what do you say to the everyday investor who's worked a lifetime who's done what they were told to do pump money into your 401k so you have a secure retirement, put as much as you can into your IRAs, work as long as you can so you can have a secure retirement. Now, we've done all that. And then you look at Wall Street not having a fiduciary responsibility, federal government only coming in after a catastrophe, not being proactive but being reactive. We have investment banking firms like Goldman Sachs shorting the industry on their own investment packets and fleecing their investors and the regulators coming in and really not regulating them. And then we have people like Jim Cramer. What do you say to the everyday investor that did everything right and has these elements, these forces on Wall Street working against them? What can well, they well, do? Again, you have to protect what you have, take your gains, 
get out of the game and wait for the next crash. You have to understand this is artificial. It's been generated by all these special interests, and it's not going to stand. So you have to get the hell out of stocks, get out of real estate that you don't need, and commodities, and gold and silver if you have that, and wait for the next crash to reinvest because everything's going to be on sale. You know, stocks are going to go down another 50, 60, 70 percent. You know, real estate's going to go down another 20, 30, 40 percent. But if you just preserve what you have in this bubble, you're way ahead just on that. Exactly. And Harry, I know you're very analytical and you've looked at the Wall Street markets for many, many years. But are you aware of any crash proof investment accounts that can stand up the market crashes? Well, yeah, I mean, again, number one is just be safe. But You know, I have a network, a dent network of largely financial advisors. Mm -hmm. And and the best advisors, they use insurance-based products because you can defer or avoid taxes legally if you invest long-term. And insurance companies have ways to protect your gains from certain losses. And the fact that these insurance companies invest largely in bonds that do well in deflationary periods. Insurance companies were the only part of the financial uh, industry in the 1930s that did well. Stock brokerage firms, banks, investment banks all went bust. Have you ever heard of a financial life insurance company filing bankruptcy? Why is it that these financial life insurance companies can cover these Category 5 hurricanes like Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and Andrew, but yet we don't see Nationwide folding their tent and going out of business, but we see Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac go out of business. Why can't Wall Street and their corporations operate under the same statutory accounting system that life insurance operates under, where they don't go out of business during a catastrophe? Well, again, it's simple. Regulations. These companies have to invest in sound things. They have to have collateral for their insurance properties. All these other companies can leverage and don't have the collateral. And, and again, that's why insurance companies did well in the 1930s when everybody else went bust because they were on leverage and investing in all types of speculative stuff. Insurance companies have to have collateral largely in bonds to back up their policies, life insurance, commercial, exactly. any type of insurance. They AIG cannot overextend. They down because of their insurance policies because their speculative division bet 30 to 1 on, you know, credit to false Yeah, stocks. they're banking arm. Yeah, they're banking arm. Mm-hmm. Well, they're in their investment arm. It wasn't banking. It wasn't even investment. It was their investment arm. They, mm-hmm. they speculated away the company. Had nothing to do. Their insurance policies were sound. If AIG had gone under... Those policies would have been taken over by some other company and would have still been sound because they had collateral and bonds. They had a trillion. They still do. AIG Life Insurance Company has a trillion dollars in what's known as a legal reserve account. I refer to it warmly as the consumer's account because for dollar for dollar, these life insurance corporations must reserve people's money. They can't put it at risk. By regulation, they're forced to be responsible. Every financial institution should be forced to be responsible with simple regulations, not this free-for-all speculative thing. Now, Joanne and I had the opportunity of going to Washington, D.C. just last week, and we attended Weiser's Symposium. Now, Weiser is Women's Institution for a Secure Retirement. And while we were there, there were senators at that symposium, and there was all kinds of presidents and CEOs of nonprofit organizations like AARP and so forth and so on. We had the opportunity of interviewing many of them, meaning the retirement media and the Crash Proof Retirement Team. And every time I would bring up fiduciary responsibility in Wall Street, no one wanted to talk about it. Every time I would bring up the viability of a life insurance company not filing bankruptcy and standing up to catastrophes, no one wanted to talk about it. And particularly when I brought up crash-proof investment accounts that went through with no fees, no upfront cost, no ongoing market fees, they post interest, they went through the 0102 crash and through the 08 crash, and not one of these crash-proof investment accounts cost anything to get involved with and yet lost nothing and whenever i tried to talk about these crash proof vehicles right down to the senators they didn't want to make a comment why is the security industry so against crash proof safe alternatives outside their industry do you know you know i hate to say it, that it's because the government and most financial institutions need this bubble 
and this leverage and investing and low interest rates, artificially low interest rates, which only encourage speculation. They need the speculation to go on to keep the bubble from bursting. It's that simple. They know that if this thing melts down, I mean, we saw it in 2008, 2009. I mean, uh, the system started to melt down like in the early 30s. Governments, financial institutions who came in and advised the governments are saying, you've got to keep us alive. Don't worry about Homer Simpson and their home underwater and falling wages and rising gas prices and food and stuff from all our stimulus. Worry about us banks, because if we go under, the whole system goes under. That's the whole kind of collusion. And it's true that everybody would suffer if things went under. But within a few years, we, in fact, we would have been over this crisis by now if it had just happened in 2008, 9, 10, 11. We'd have been over it coming out the other side like 1933 Ford. We roared out of that downturn. We're not roaring out of this downturn because they never fixed the problems. Harry Dent, I got to ask this question. Is our federal government actually trying to keep the economy afloat and make things better? Or are they themselves part of an intentional fleecing on the everyday investor who's worked a lifetime? They think they're trying to keep afloat. They think they're trying to keep the next depression from happening. They don't realize that the natural cycles in our economy, the free market systems, need booms and busts. They need inflation. Inflation encourages innovation. Deflation encourages innovation. If you don't have these down cycles like the 70s and the 30s and now, you don't keep creating innovation and growth, they're killing the golden goose. They're not intending to do this, but that is exactly what they're doing. They're killing the golden goose, and and they're preventing the natural systems from creating growth again. They just don't understand the economy. We're talking to Harry Dent. He's the editor of the free newsletter, Survive and Prosper. You can get a hold of this by going to www.com harrydent.com. I'm a student of Harry's. I'm going to get a copy of his free newsletters. You should do the same. That's harrydent.com. Okay, let me get this straight, Harry Dent. If I'm understanding our whole conversation today in this interview, we start with deregulation in the 80s. We continue with the savings and loans, 700 of them going under because they're not regulated and they can't regulate themselves. Then we go into the 90s and hit 2000s with the dirty books from Enron. Then we have the 9-11 event in this country that put our financial system on its heels, the major crash, and then it started with the government failed programs. Let's give everyone a mortgage. Let's roll your clunker into a dealership and pay you $4,500. Let's give you a trillion dollars banking industry and don't worry about lending it out. And now we're up to quantitative easing, money that's not being backed by gold and hooking our country on it. What's next, Harry Dent? Is this what I should draw from this conversation we're having? Yeah. If you keep taking more and more of a drug, what do you do? You, you collapse and hit bottom at some point. I think we're going to hit bottom between 2014 and 19 and a great deflation like the early 1930s. All we've done is put this off. This should have happened between 2008 and 2010 or 11 or 12. But it didn't. Government stopped it. They just pushed in more of the drug, more money, keep the banks going, keep the investment leverage going, create more bubbles, which makes the wealthiest people in this country who control... 50% of the spending, the top 20%, uh, and have the lowest unemployment, they're not feeling this downturn. The everyday person is feeling it. So they keep it going until something goes wrong and the bubble burst again like in 2008. All it takes is a little prick in this bubble. I got it, Harry Dent. Got a question for you. I had the opportunity, along with Joanne Small, to visit the Inspector General in Washington, D.C., then Inspector General Kotz. I asked the good Inspector General, what was his biggest challenge? I want you to hear the soundbite and then tell me what your thoughts are. Here's Inspector General Kotz, who resided at the SEC from 2007 to 2012. And the question was, what is your biggest challenge while you're here at the Security Exchange Commission? I think just generally in the federal government, management is often a big challenge. Taking appropriate action where there is wrongdoing or misconduct, you know, and managers often are reluctant to take action against people who work for them. It's difficult to take action. It involves litigation. can be very messy. You know, it takes time out of the regular work that you do. I think 
in general, that's always a challenge to get the manager to do the right thing, whether it's terminate or discipline an employee who engages in wrongdoing. It's very important to do that because it sends a message to the rest of the folks in the agency that this is not going to be tolerated, and then you have a much more productive uh, work environment. Harry Dent, you just listened to the Inspector General H. David Kotz of the Security Exchange Commission. What are your thoughts on what he said his biggest challenge is, his own management inside his own government agency? That's true everywhere. Business, Wall Street, government, everybody wants to protect the status quo. I used to be a turnaround manager in small companies in the early 80s, and you know things would get out of whack. And things would not change until the company went down and somebody like me came in from a consultant, took over the company, and then corrected all these imbalances, fired people. I mean, when you can communicate to a company that we're all going to go under unless 30% of us go, everybody votes for it. Only in a crisis do people do the right thing. That's why we need a crisis. You cannot change, as I said before, you cannot change all these imbalances from special interests and over leverage and government stimulation and all this stuff that's built up in the last three decades and this boom. A lot of great things happen in the boom and these great things will pay off for decades and technologies and all this sort of stuff. But we have to rebalance the system and it's not going to happen naturally unless, I mean, with all these, you know, people not wanting to fire people, not wanting to face reality, being in denial, you have to get into reality, and nothing like a crisis to get you into reality. Well, wow, that makes a whole lot of sense, Harry Dent. You're listening to Mr. Harry Dent. He's the editor of the free newsletter, Survive and Prosper. You can find his newsletter for free on www.harrydent.com or simply go to crashproofretirement.com, and we'll have Harry's link there. Harry, in summary, give us your prediction What exactly is going to happen? What is 2014 bringing to us economic-wise? Well, I think 2014 is going to start the next crash. Now, how fast it develops and how far depends, again, how governments respond. I think government's going to lose credibility. If we crash again after five years of unprecedented stimulus, people are going to lose confidence in the fact that the government can artificially turn around our economy. Everybody intuitively knows this. They know it's wrong to keep creating debt and keep stimulating. But but as long as things go okay, people go, oh, well, things are a little better than they were five years ago, especially the rich today. But that's what it'll take. I think 2014 to 2019, we're going to see worse trends, demographics, stock market, everything. I think the biggest crash is going to come between 2014 and 15. Do you stand alone uh, in that prediction? Pretty much. Well, there, there's other people, you know, Robert Prechter, you know, Elliot Wave, Lacey Hunt, uh, an economist I, I like, and a few others. But no, no, most people think things are going okay. The government's doing the right thing. I mean, add one more name to that list Phil Canella. I called for the crash after 08, like you, on my radio show. I called for the crash between 2013 and 2015. I said that in 08, this is a Category 5 economic storm, and because it's worldwide, there's going to be a five-year eye where things will be calm, and this back end of this hurricane will do the most damage, and I call for that in 2014 to 15. I agree with you, Harry Dent. It has to happen. It's just a matter of how quick and how soon or not, but it will happen. Our economies cannot move forward if we don't have this crisis and don't deleverage 22 trillion dollars in private debt that happened in just eight years and all this endless government debt and entitlements there's no possible way to pay 66 trillion dollars and rising of unfunded entitlements with a smaller generation to follow the baby boom it's not even possible a a 10 year old with a calculator could figure this out and economists and government officials just can't because they keep their rosy predictions and, and keep hoping that we'll grow at 5% forever. This is just bubble logic. It's insanity. Harry Dent, in your heart and soul, will you tell us what it means to the everyday investor when this market crashes? Are they going to be affected if they're mainly on the markets? Well, yeah, they're going to be wiped out. We're going to be in a crisis. We're going to have to work longer, which is good, because people who work longer are actually happier than people who retire and do nothing. But we're going to have to go through this crisis, and the only way to go through it is to protect yourself when everything goes down, and then you make money on the downturn. If you just hold a dollar in cash and stocks drop 60%, which I think they're going to drop at least in the next few years, you've made that much, because you can buy stuff 60% 
cheaper. If real estate drops another 30 40%, which I think it will, you've made money by buying it later. So just protect your capital and look to reinvest every time things go down. That's the only way to play it. Harry Dent, I want to thank you so very much on behalf of our CBS Radio Network listeners on giving us some insight on where you think the economy is headed and what the federal government is doing to the everyday investor. But before I do let you go, Harry, can you tell us what you're working on right now? You know, I have a new book coming out, The Demographic Cliff, on January 7th, just a few months from now. I took a huge drop in advance just to get a publisher to come out to accelerate and come out with this earlier because I am convinced that the stock markets are going to peak in early 2014 and going to see a big crash. I want to be ahead of this for investors to warn them. So, so the best thing you do, yeah, I've got a new book coming out. You can get on Amazon and get it, get on the wait list and get it as soon as it comes out. But it's going to come out January 7th. And I tell you, it's comprehensive. We look at the world. We look at debt. We look at demographics around the world. We do, look you look at weather, do you look at weather patterns? You know what? I do look at sunspot cycles. Uh-huh. One of the biggest cycles in the stock markets has been rising energy from the sun and in 10-year cycles and then declines. And the next decline, guess what, is due 2014 to 2019. Wow. It all starts to line up, doesn't it? Yeah. We're listening to Harry Dent, editor of the free newsletter, Survive and Prosper. You can find Harry's newsletter on www.harrydent.com, and it is free. It is filled with information that could help you, that could get you through retirement rather than just making it to retirement. Harry Dent, we all really enjoyed this conversation, your insights, and some of your predictions of what you feel is going to happen. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. The Crash Proof Retirement Show has been a production of RMI, Retirement Media Inc., Truth for the American Retiree.